So I'm going to sort of talk a bit about the elephant in the room, uh, and that is the, the, the concerns, the worries about uh, relapse of our lymphoma, uh, and use that as a, as a means of discussing uh, clinical trials that we have available in Australia in a little bit uh, more depth. Because for those of us who are newly diagnosed with lymphoma, uh, who are very hopeful of either a cure or a prolonged remission, or those of us here who have had uh, one, two, three, five, or how, however many relapses, um, I think it's very important that while this is a very confronting concept, that everyone gets, I hope everyone gets the, the take home message today that relapse lymphoma is still uh, very treatable with so many of the promising new therapies that Professor Saal has uh, introduced us uh, to, as well as uh, bendamustine. Um, just coming back to some of the terminology that's already uh, slipped in, and to just explain a little bit of that to you. Um, we doctors, we say the disease is refractory to our therapy when it's, it's growing during the chemotherapy. Now that's actually very rare in the first line setting, but it becomes increasingly common as people have second or third or, or subsequent uh, therapies. When your doctor tells you your disease is, is stable, effectively that's translation for it's less than 50%. There's been a less than 50% reduction in, this, in the volume of the lymphoma, um, but we haven't yet received, uh, obtained a partial response, where, whereby we've had a 50% reduction in its volume on the CT scan, but there's still some residual disease that we can see on, on the CT scan. A complete remission is defined traditionally when on a CT scan we can't see any enlarged nodes be, uh, present uh, which reflect the presence of the lymphoma. And maybe later on in the, in the uh, question and answer session, on the couch session, we can discuss the actual definitions of complete remission because certainly as, uh, as Professor Saal has uh, explained, uh, PET CT scanning is really replacing CT scan as the gold standard uh, for definition of complete remission uh, for most lymphomas. Uh, but in addition, with greater sophisticated uh, detection of lymphoma residing in the body, we also often also have some very sensitive uh, blood and bone marrow tests uh, which help us to define complete remission for some <coughs> lymphomas. Beyond achieving remission, it's really only Dr. Time who determines whether you are cured. Professor Rimmel talked about how we can give you prognoses. We can talk to you about the average. We can talk to you about the highest 10%, the lowest 10%. But in the end, all that we can do is give you uh, our best estimate to help you arrange you know, your own you know, social life uh, planning. Um, and you know that's that's very important. Uh, and you know, please don't get disheartened, uh, or hopefully be very hopeful when you manage to prove your doctor's uh, predictions very wrong. Now, uh, relapse is defined as disease that's come back after you've obtained uh, a complete remission, whereas progressive disease is di disease after you've either been in a stable or a partial uh, remission. Now. Relapsed lymphoma, as I said, is, is still very treatable, particularly if the relapse has occurred after being in remission for, for several years, and if the patient still, regardless of what age they are, if they are still uh, very fit and, and capable of receiving additional uh, rounds, if you're willing to, and willing indeed, uh, to go it again with uh, some further, further treatments. And second and even third, more uh, remissions can, can last for many months. Uh, and indeed, for some lymphomas, even after a first relapse, the goal of treatment uh, is still cure. But I want to talk, talk you through in a great a bit of detail uh, the, the treatments that we now have in 2005, which are very much based on the huge advances made through clinical trials re re research in the last 20 years in particular. And the reason I've focused on relapsed lymphoma is because that is generally where new therapeutic <coughs> treatment approaches, new therapies themselves, are introduced uh, into 
into the practice of, of lymphoma care before they start being moving up, moving up into being introduced in the, in the frontline setting. But certainly, because of the promise of so many of these new therapies, uh, a number of you are actually receiving these new therapies in the context of your first line of therapy rather than for multiple year relapse disease. And that makes it a very exciting time for us because our research is certainly moving us away from absolute vodka, um, the very blunderbuss, very toxic chemotherapies that we had uh, in the 70s and 80s onto these smarter targeted therapies. Rituximab, the MAPTHERA, the anti-CD20 antibody is no longer a novel uh, new research uh, agent. It's very much part of the standard, whether it's combined with bendamustine, whether it's combined with CHOP, whether it's combined with anything else. Uh, it's very much a standard of care these days. But Professor Siles talked about the GA101 or obinutuzumab, the anti-CD20 antibody that appears to be more powerful in treatment of uh, some lymphomas uh, in early uh, clinical trial results which need uh, further maturation before we can really give the green light to the use of obinutuzumab. Similarly, brentuximab is targeted against the protein CD30 present on Hodgkin lymphoma cells as well as many of the T cell, the rare T cell uh, lymphomas. And brentuximab delivers that toxin that Professor Sahl was talking about right to the uh, lymphoma cell. We also uh, have access through clinical trials now uh, the ibrutinib and other brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, that inhibit the enzymes on the surface of the lymphoma cells and interrupt the downstream signaling that uh, the cell requires for its, its growth and survival, as well as idolalacib, uh, another kinase, another enzyme inhibitor, uh, and uh, Certainly, uh, this agent is currently being submitted to the Therapeutic Goods Authority uh, for their approval on the basis of the clinical research that has been uh, led by Professor Siles and other of his international colleagues uh, into this uh, new enzyme inhibitor. And lenalidomide, uh, the, the sister agent to thalidomide, which uh, sends shivers in everyone's uh, spine, is actually a very powerful immune modulatory agent uh, and can you know, educate our own immune system to try and uh, control the lymphoma. And immune checkpoint blockade, uh, the nivolumab, how do you pronounce it? I've still got to get my tongue around so many of these words. Nivolumab, nivolumab, all right. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs> um, and and uh, pembrolizumab, whatever. They're all uh, very exciting blockades of the uh, programmed cell death pathway. So, not every patient is appropriate for a clinical trial, and we've all heard about the enormous spectrum of the different types of lymphomas. Uh, and so, you know, it's very important. No one clinical research unit can possibly have a broad enough uh, clinical trial portfolio to, uh, to be able to offer to every patient with lymphoma with newly diagnosed or, or relapsed disease. And I've borrowed this slide from one of my French colleagues, and it, it emphasises to me the importance of the individualised therapeutic decision-making that needs to go on when one considers a patient with relapsed lymphoma, we have to consider the subtype of the lymphoma, the location of the lymphoma, the patient's own age and, and fitness and their own uh, willingness uh, to have treatment, in addition to the previous treatment that they have received. But today's physician is not a cantankerous Dr. House, who is the autocrat who says, you will do this with you know, uh, astounding brilliance. Today's physician is a team and multidisciplinary team uh, meetings are being held all around Australia on a very regular basis with clear documentation, discussion and debate around the, the diagnosis, 
the staging, the previous treatment, and what are the appropriate therapeutic uh, approaches for patients with relapsed lymphoma, and whether there is a clinical trial that they should be screened to see whether it is appropriate to offer the patient participation in that trial, to talk to them about the purpose of the trial, the procedures involved in participation, the potential benefits and the known risks of participation, along with the alternative treatments that they would be offered if they weren't participating in that trial, and importantly stressing the fact that clinical trial participation is a voluntary act by yourself, not just the moment you sign the consent form, but during the process of that entire years and years of participation in the trial. And I assure you it's not years and years usually of treatment, but years and years of, of follow-up uh, in a trial. So, clinical research is integrating clinical, our clinical expertise with the best available external evidence from systematic research. And it's very important to point out that that is actually a bit different to just expert opinion that we may find uh, on the net or, or elsewhere. And it's very essential that we bridge this divide uh, between the sciences that underpin our knowledge of our disease and the application of that science in, in clinical practice. So what is a good clinical trial? Well, firstly, it's one that asks the right question. And that might not be the question that Professor Rimmel or Professor Saal or I think of, but the question that we think of on your behalf. It's got to be reflecting the, the community's values and the community's priorities. It's got to be a trial that you want to participate in. It's got to be ethically justifiable and conducted eth ethically, and we have a very, very rigorous code of good clinical practice that is applied internationally. And the question has to be able to be reliably answered. The statistics have to be right so that we can actually get an answer at the end of the trial with minimal bias. And so a clinical trial is a carefully designed study conducted under the code of GCP that seeks to determine under controlled conditions the safety and effectiveness of a new treatment method or a drug. And it's this that allows those laboratory breakthroughs in the test tube to actually be converted into our clinical practice and become new standard of care for treatment. So I'm going to go through with you the drug development timeline. When, on the basis of a, a biologic, a scientific rationale, a new agent is tested against various cell lines and then after animal testing, that actual process takes a good two to four years. The actual clinical research and development of a drug can take three years to 10 years. And that's because the first clinical trials in humans have to be all about safety. Can we, in 20 odd patients, deliver increasingly small doses, increasingly larger doses of this agent without causing undesirable, intolerable side effects in humans. And after that phase one, we move on to phase two. Does this drug, whose toxicity profile we know, whose dose we've tried to work out on the basis of the phase one testing is, is the best dose to be giving, does it actually work? Does it actually have efficacy against lymphoma in patients? And these phase two trials may be just 100 odd patients. And then come the very expensive trials to conduct that Professor Saal mentioned, and that is the phase three, the randomized clinical trial, where we are comparing the new treatment approach with the standard treatment approach that's in current practice. And we, we acknowledge that many of these phase three trials, if not most of them, are industry-sponsored studies because of the sheer cost of conducting under the code of good clinical practice, the very expensive, there's huge numbers of patients required for these trials, but we do be, assure you we work very hard 
in partnership with industry and also on our own, in our own collaborative groups uh, around the world in collaboration, uh, country to country, uh, to try and answer the rat to design the randomised control trials that answer the questions that are important to our, our lymphoma patients. A new drug application is something that we could end up spending and debating for uh, the next hour or so. We acknowledge that in Australia this is a very uh, long process, but it is also a very robust process uh, to ensure that the Therapeutic Goods Authority only approves agents that are demonstrated to be safe and effective, and the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme only funds agents that the Australian pocket can afford. And then the other important thing that mustn't be forgotten is the importance of post-market surveillance so that we don't end up with another thalidomide scare, another Vioxx scare, um, because clinical trials, even if they're done in thousands of patients, do not uh, provide the full safety and efficacy profile of any new agent. So why would you yourself participate in a clinical trial? And the obvious first answer is the direct benefit. But that's the direct benefit, not just from the studied therapy, but even when the treatment is standard, research has demonstrated that patient outcomes are better. And that's probably in part due to the very rigorous monitoring and follow-up that patients get within their clinical trial. All my clinical trial patients love the fact that they have one-on-one -on -one care coordination with the clinical trials coordinator who knows where to track me down when the counts are low, they've got a bit of nausea when they need, need you know, instant medical advice. There's also the benefit to medicine and to science and the benefit to future patients. We are all by nature altruistic and want, having benefited from the patients who have participated in the clinical trials before us, we want to make our own contribution uh, to clinical research. It speeds development of effective therapies but importantly also, clinical trials research stops the development of ineffective or overly toxic therapies. And also here, particularly uh, a particular motivator for us here in Australia is it does offer us early access to therapies that are not available on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Even though bendamustine is not yet PBS approved, PBS uh, subsidised in Australia, I know there are a number of you who have accessed this agent in the context of clinical trials when pairing bendamustine with other, other therapies. So why not participate in clinical trials? And there are a number of very right reasons for not participating. And the first one is the particular trial that you have been offered might not be answering the right question, might not be giving what you think is the right therapy for you. And I urge you, if you have your uh, uh, hesitations about trial participation, uh, to express them very loudly and clearly uh, to the physician who's offering your, you participation in that study. The direct risk of the unknown, you know, the unknown nature and the limited knowledge that we have about agents, particularly in phase one and phase two testing, must be acknowledged. And it's certainly a hell of a lot easier to just have the standard of care that your doctor is going to prescribe for you. And for many patients, particularly those when their lymphoma is newly diagnosed, to consider participating in the, you know, making a decision about participating in a clinical trial, reading the 20-page document that was eight pages when we first drafted it and then became 20 pages after the lawyers got to it, it's just, it's just too much for patients to, to absorb and consider, particularly patients for whom English is not their first language. Clinical trials participation is a little bit more onerous. It's more onerous for the patient. It's certainly more onerous for the clinician because there are more tests and more visits generally that happen, probably by the order of at least another, another 10%, um, because of the very close monitoring that is uh, required usually in clinical trial protocols. And it's important to ask always uh, when we consider whether we want to participate in a trial, and you also should consider, you know, who benefits from participation in this trial, 
um, and also the implications of whether if I was on a randomised trial and I didn't get access to the, what I think might be the new butte uh, next uh, thing since sliced bread, um, you know, is it going to be possible for me to get access to this agent in the future? Um, and I think it's very important that we're always mindful about the, the competing priorities uh, that we have uh, in terms of uh, both patients and industry in the conduct of clinical trials. But nonetheless, I think it's very important that we have to counter the negative perceptions of trials that exist out there in the community where people who participate in clinical trials are perceived as human guinea pigs because public awareness of clinical trials is not the same as public understanding of them. Now, in New South Wales, but also in every state in Australia now, uh, except for Queensland, but the Queensland app is coming, uh, is a mobile app that helps us busy clinicians keep tabs of all the currently uh, conducting, the currently recruiting clinical trials that are available locally. All right, we have uh, at least half a dozen haematology apps and many other apps for other cancers. And this app is, um, and it's not something that I necessarily encourage you to download, but I want you to be aware that it's in your clinician's pocket almost certainly. And they are keeping themselves briefed as to what are the new agents that are currently being tested uh, in, in clinical trials that are currently recruiting in Australia. And since we launched this app uh, 20 months ago, there have been an average of 10 patients a month who have been referred to other hospitals in New South Wales to participate in clinical trials. Because ultimately, in Australia, we do have that, you know, and all physicians want to be able to be offering to patients what they feel is the best therapy for them, and physicians increasingly have no compunction to recommend to their patient uh, that they go elsewhere, whether it be Royal Prince Alfred Hospital for someone who's at Concord, whether it be Royal North Shore Hospital or Westmead, you know, somewhere that is feasible for the patient uh, to commute to participate in clinical trials. Notwithstanding that, we have had many patients from uh, Milton in southern New South Wales, from Dorigo in northern New South Wales, from the Central Coast. Patients will travel quite long distances to access new therapies uh, in clinical trials. So, in Hodgkin lymphoma, I just want to co comment on one new agent that has uh, occurred and become increasingly available, uh, not so much in clinical trials now, but uh, because it's, as Professor Sal pointed out, uh, this anti-CD20 uh, drug conjugate with uh, the, the toxin has been proven to be so effective, it's now actually been studied uh, in first line. Um, and this anti-CD30 antibody, uh, adcetris or brintuximab, is very effective uh, in treating patients with relapsed Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, either after they've had a transplant uh, for their first relapse or after they've uh, had a, a second relapse. And there are excellent response rates. Generally, about three quarters of patients will have a response and a third of them will have a complete response. But the main side effect that occurs after weeks and weeks of treatment is this numbness that requires dose adjustments and dose delays. The bottom line is it is extremely expensive and this is one of the reasons why, although it's approved by the Therapeutic Goods Authority, it is not yet PBS listed here in Australia. It, it is also another agent, as I said, that has been used uh, and is approved in PBS listed uh, for certain patients with uh, relapsed uh, T-cell lymphomas. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the PD-1 inhibitors, but certainly they are available uh, in clinical trials for patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma in Australia. I think I'm going to leave uh, any discussion about low-grade lymphoma to the breakout session uh, that we're going to be having here because that is going to be uh, webcast and there is a mind-boggling plethora of agents that are currently in clinical trials uh, for patients both with relapsed and newly diagnosed uh, follicular and other low-grade lymphomas. I might say here perhaps if any of you are, have marginal lymphoma, zone lymphoma, I think that's a very unfortunate title.
because I'm increasingly feeling that marginal zone lymphoma patients are very marginalised and it's very difficult to find uh, clinical trials that they can participate in um, and that you know, has implications potentially for their access to these agents when they're approved. Um, for relapsed aggressive uh, lymphomas, there aren't so many trials recruiting currently, but I know I looked up the app uh, today, and there's one called Checkmate, uh, which is a nivolumumab uh, study for patients with relapsed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, clinical trial is certainly, I strongly believe, the best therapeutic option for patients with relapsed T-cell lymphomas. They are very difficult diseases. Uh, to get back into remission and keep in a sustained remission after these lymphomas have relapsed. Um, however, large clinical trials for T-cell lymphomas are not very uh, commonly available. We've just had uh, one close and we'll have another one open soon here in, in New South Wales uh, using the selective inhibitors of nuclear export, i.e. just another targeted therapy uh, for lymphoma that has uh, significant promise. Basically, clinical trials are really designed to help you live longer and live better. And through clinical trials research, there is no doubt that hundreds of lymphoma patients in Australia have had access to all these agents, but importantly also to personal care coordination by their study uh, coordinator. After relapse, it's very important that everyone keeps hope but also to acknowledge that those hopes sometimes change. And it's important that every patient you know, maintains their hopes, works out their milestones, because I think as a, as a physician, uh, when talking to patients about participating in a clinical trial, we, we have a very delicate balance between not overselling the trial, and we need to foster realistic hopes for, for remission. Um, we need to uh, be very careful that we're not are peddling false expectations. But nonetheless, for me, the joy of lymphoma care certainly comes uh, from the rapid advances from bringing research into clinical practice and also how often after relapse my poor prognosis patients prove, uh, prove me wrong through their participation in clinical research. Thank you all very much indeed.